what we're really talking about are thinking about designing devices or materials that are extremely small. And when I mean nano, um, it's something you really can't see with the visible eye. So if you have a piece of uh, hair, it's about 100 microns. Um, an individual cell in the body is about 10 microns. Uh, if you get smaller and smaller and think about sort of atoms and molecules, that's when you start talking about nanometers. So several orders of magnitude smaller than anything we could sort of think about manipulating with our hands. And why is that exciting? Well, if you think about biology, it really is on the same size scale as what I'm talking about. That is, if we we'll go from individual cells on the micron scale to virus particles, to uh, machinery within the cell, to uh, DNA, RNA, uh, ribosomes, things that actually make the body work, those are all nanoscale. And so when people started thinking about, okay, can we engineer things that begin to manipulate biology or at least um, can probe biology, uh, we thought, well, we need to develop tools that are smaller and materials that are smaller. And so uh, people who are in the biological area are really excited about this. So the two things that we're really working on are thinking about nanotechnology for uh, sort of two main applications. One is to replace uh, damaged body parts. So looking at new implant materials, looking at ways that we can regenerate tissue. So if you have a heart attack, how do you actually get heart tissue that regenerates into the right um, phenotype or doesn't become scar tissue but actually becomes functional? It turns out we use use nanomaterials to do a lot of those things because cells respond to particular architectures um, in a very unique way. And uh, probably more of a, an immediate goal is the delivery of therapeutics. So uh, we're looking at ways that you can target cancer, um, deliver insulin, um, drugs for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, where we're not developing the drug, but we're really developing a way to get the drug where it needs to go and avoid toxic side effects of having a drug that's not um, targeted and packaged and actually get to the right place within a cell. You know, of course, I, yeah, I think it's great, go nano, uh, but, but I think it's precisely the word unregulated in the sense that uh, you know, what, where is the fine line between, okay, here I'm going to use it in my tennis ball versus my cosmetics versus I'm going to inject it into somebody and, and treat a disease. For drugs, you know, it's very well regulated by the FDA. For nanomaterials that are sort of in contact with the body outside, um, you still may be taking up a lot of these particles, but, you know. You look good. Yeah. <laughs> Just on, related to that, I wonder if it's more along the lines of, is it, it's a lot of quantum mechanics that are going into this, right? It's all quantum mechanics. I mean, so we're talking like quantum chemistry and all right, these kinds right. of things, right? So it's not chemistry on some large scale, but it's actually the chemistry of individual atoms that are really helping everything right. together. So, you know, if, if you actually look at the strength of two atoms together, it's extremely strong. We just don't think about it because most materials are billions of atoms. Uh, and so again, if you break things down to individual components, you get these, these properties that sort of come out are so small, what kind of tools do you use to manipulate them? Yeah, so in fact, that's sort of a field in itself. How do you, well, one, how do you visualize them? How do you manipulate them? Um, so we use, uh, so we use a lot of electron microscopy, so um, large scale, high energy uh, microscopes that are, uh, so you really need a wavelength of light that's about the same wavelength to visualize these. Um, the other thing we use is atomic force microscopy, so uh, we have a very small tip that probes the surface and gives us sort of the, the inverse image of what we're trying to image and we can sort of deduce what we're creating. Um, so some of it is by uh, direct visualization, other things we sort of infer uh, based on the structure and the, and the properties. It's, in some of our studies, um, it's very difficult to, so we're trying to do a study where we're looking at targeting colon cancer um, using these types of particles. And we can't really go in and see how many particles are stuck to the cancer. Um, we basically do this by imaging and trying to get a volume distribution of you know, how much lights up within that tumor versus another place. So it's a sort of indirect way to get at you know, this volume of particles at a, at a particular surface.
So I, I must have missed in the shuffle, what sort of uh, exciting in your own department that you're doing research in terms of nanomedicine, and like from the top down, what, what sort of disease are you going after and, and how are you progressing? So, uh, so you know, cancer is probably the big one that a lot of people are doing. We're actually, um, so we're interested in, in colon cancer is one area. Uh, the other area that we're looking at is how to get um, insulin uh, in more, actually uh, an oral form of insulin using nanotechnology so you don't have to inject yourselves uh, and getting it targeted again to the right area. Uh, we're also developing some ways that you can deliver drugs through the blood-brain barrier. So um, another place that's been notoriously difficult to get drugs into because uh, most drugs don't penetrate, um, well, you, you inject them systemically and they have to make it all the way up to the cerebral arteries and veins um, to get into places um, to treat things like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, um, mental disorders, etc. And nanoparticles, if you design them right, actually can penetrate and actually take considerable payloads into those areas. Um, and, a, and a quick follow-up, real quick follow-up. And how is it progressing? And how is it progressing? Mm -hmm. uh, so it's progressing well. I still hear, um, but uh, <laughs> I, I, I'd say it's a long road in the sense that a lot of what we've been doing in the last year has been really flushing out all the toxicology and making sure that every material that we develop, um, we know how it responds from inflammation, cytokine response, um, you know what happens to long-term exposure short-term exposure, et cetera. So, in fact, we've sort of developed a lot of materials and applications, but now we've actually um, gone on and we just, you know, we're about to publish two papers that really look at, okay, here are all the different materials that at least we work on in the lab. Here's their bulk form, here's their nanomaterial form, and compare them because we know the FDA-approved form is generally the bulk form. And so what differences are them between those two areas? Great. You've mentioned antibiotics and bacteria, and I was wondering if there was anything in the works to target viruses, which are very much smaller, and it seems to be that might be a better target, or a good target, but um, there's no other way of getting at right now? Yeah, so it, it is, um, it's actually something, so I was actually in a meeting today, and they brought that same question up. Uh, so we haven't done that in our lab, but it really is something that could be amenable to, to what we're, we're looking at. Um, antiviral therapy, and also uh, just being able to do what we call viral capture, because a lot of these materials have high surface area. If you can use them as, as ways to actually um, almost grab viruses from a, from a chemical perspective. Um, we're looking into some of those things, but it, we definitely haven't done much in that area yet. So I'm wondering, what are the fundamental biology problems you run into? Like, what stops you to you know, make this a long-term project rather than, and especially in the genomic level? So I think a lot of it is the fact that we, we you know, we only get a snapshot of sort of how biology responds to um, either the materials or the treatment. So, uh, for those of you in back who didn't hear, but, uh, um, so you know, what what are our roadblocks in terms of the biology? And I think it's it's that one, the field is still relatively new, and um, you know, for for us to really know how biology processes, what are the biological effects, etc. Um, you know, you can only you can only do so much in a laboratory setting and you know whether or not we need to have sort of the real-time data which is not going to be done and if you think about how long this field has been around it's really sort of the last seven eight years that people have started to look at this so uh, if we compare that to other fields that have matured um, generally it takes about 40 to 50 years to really sort of see the maturation of a field and some of the biological sciences. So um, I think there's just a lot of unknowns and that's sort of the, the roadblock. Not that 